Ford's Mustang gets serious in sixth generation guys. Serious enough to take on international markets with European orientated engine and suspension technology, hence the availability of right hand drive in this car for the very first time. What hasn't changed is the original model's mantra of plenty of power at an affordable price. That's served up both in fastback coupe guys and in this convertible form. In either case, you'll get a car that'll make you feel alive. There's nothing quite like it. Think Ford Mustang and you instantly imagine Steve McQueen, Desert Highways, the American dream, and a car you can't have here. Except that these days you can. For the first time in more than 60 years of production, right-hand drive Mustangs sit in selected Ford showrooms across the land. There's even the option of Europeanized four-cylinder turbo power as an alternative to the traditional five-litre V8. This sixth generation looks for part two, whether in coupe form or this convertible guise. All of which is just as well if this car really is to stand a chance of reaching out beyond the traditional muscle car market. Would you? Could you really justify one? American buyers have always been able to. From the moment the original Mustang was launched back in 1964, it was an instant hit and went on to be the fastest selling car in history, with more than one million examples finding homes in the first year and a half it was on sale. From then on, the Stang became an American institution, the muscle car all others were judged by, especially in the fifth generation guys launched in 2005. It was this version, styled to reflect the 60s original, that reignited worldwide interest in this model. Customers from around the globe soon queuing up to import it from the USA. Ford bosses took note. For years, they'd imagined the Mustang only as an American product, believing that other markets needed a less aggressive design of sports coupe, which is why this side of the Atlantic, we got models like the Capri in the 70s and the Probe in the 90s. Hopefully though, those kinds of coupes are now a thing of the past. Customers across the world have made it clear that they love the Mustang just as much as Yankee drivers do, which is why this sixth generation version was designed with international markets and right hand drive in mind from the very outset. That's why buyers over here get the 2.3 litre EcoBoost four cylinder engine option I mentioned earlier as an alternative to the big old Coyote V8 you'd expect this car to have. It's also why this sixth generation model is 28% stiffer than its predecessor with suspension that now ditches the old leaf springs in favour of a much more sophisticated multi-link rear setup. Plus, all versions sold this side of the Atlantic get a performance pack as standard that offers bigger, stronger brakes as well as extra cooling for the engine. Will it all be enough to allow this modern Mustang to rival some of the best coupes and convertibles money can buy? Come on, let's find out. So, What's it like? Well, settle in, and as expected, it is, of course, all very different to the kind of European hot hatch or sports coupe you could buy for the same kind of money. Fortunately, though, when you fire up the engine, well, that sounds very different too, which is encouraging given that here we've chosen to test the variant that in theory ought to make most sense to buyers this side of the pond. It's the version fitted with much the same turbocharged 2.3 litre four cylinder power plant that Ford already fits to its stonkingly fast Focus RS hot hatch. So in theory, there's no need to feel short changed in opting for a derivative that's around 75% more efficient than its V8 counterpart. Yes, you heard that right. Because this Mustang weighs over 100 kilograms more than a Focus RS, this 317 brake horsepower EcoBoost unit doesn't feel quite as eager here as it does in that car, but it still packs a big punch, covering off the rest of 62 mile an hour sprint in 5.8 seconds before heading on to 145 miles an hour. These figures being the same for the fastback coupe variant or a convertible model like the one we're trying here. 
They also remain the same whether you want to change gear yourself with the six-speed manual or let the car take the strain with the automatic six-speeder fitted in this case. If, like the majority of buyers, you feel you simply must have the V8 version to fulfill your ultimate Mustang fantasy, then you really do get a substantial hunk of Michigan metalwork beneath the bonnet of the top GT variant you'll need. A huge 5-litre motor cranking out 416 brake horsepower. That's enough to take you to 62 miles an hour in just 4.8 seconds on the way to a top speed electronically pegged at 155 miles an hour. In other words, the sort of pace necessary to square up to something much more expensive like a BMW M4 or a V8 Mercedes AMG C63 Coupe. Even more impressive is the way this Ford's V8 thunders through its gears, whether you choose a stick shift or opt for that auto with its steering wheel paddle shifters. All of this, though, you'll have expected. Mustangs always did go very fast in a straight line. Earlier ones, though, were laughably inept around the bends, unless you happen to have a tyre-smoking test track to hand. Is this version better? Absolutely. Yes, it feels its size when you're threading it down twisting secondary roads. Don't expect the eager chuckability of a TT or an M4. But it's a lot more agile and easier to place through the bends than you ever expect it's going to be. Much of that prowess attributable to the more rigid body and the clever multi-link rear suspension that replaces the crude leaf-sprung setup of previous models. Thanks to this, in the dry at least, the back tyres are kept firmly in contact with the road virtually all the time. Hence excellent grip and traction further aided by the limited slip differential that's standard with all Mustangs. It keeps all of that power in check so it's not wasted in wheel spin as you power hard out of the corners. You'll certainly need that in the GT V8 version. It has masses of mid-range power, 530 newton meters of it, compared to 432 newton meters for the four-cylinder model. And it means that a five-liter Mustang goes like a bullet when it comes to overtaking slower traffic. Indeed, it will keep accelerating way beyond the 5,500 RPM point, where an EcoBoost version like this one will have given you all it has. Peak V8 power is delivered at 6,500 RPM, but the engine is happy to carry on pulling beyond that right up to the 7,000 RPM red line. You want to drive your Mustang like this too, particularly if it's a V8, primarily because the engine sounds so much better when you do. A little disappointingly, the oral fireworks you get with both derivatives are somewhat muted at lower speeds, but things get nice and snarly once you start to work the car a little harder. The soundtrack enhanced by one of those sound symposer systems that amplifies the engine note through the stereo speakers. But hang on, a sound symposer on a Mustang? It's not the sort of thing you'd think a real muscle car would need. Nor would you expect that such a model would feel it necessary to mess around with three steering weights and no fewer than four driving modes. The steering system is called Selectable Effort Electric Power Assisted Steering. It even sounds horrible, doesn't it? At least the setup is reasonably feelsome. There are normal, sport and comfort options, though it's not quite as sharp and responsive as the helm you'd get in a really good European rival. But then this is a different kind of sports car, a big old bruiser that, as it turns out, you need that quartet of advanced track selectable driving modes to properly control. Away from the normal setting, there's a choice of Sport Plus, Race Track or Snow Wet options, all of which do the usual things that settings of this kind tend to do. Tweaking throttle response, steering feel, stability control thresholds and on auto models, gear shift timings too. But let's move on to something that's far more the kind of thing you'd expect from a Mustang, track apps. This is a suite of performance features that really do allow you to irresponsibly enjoy yourself in this car. The function selectable via this central screen between the dials and the instrument binnacle. An accelerometer 
shows the vehicle's longitudinal and latitudinal acceleration and deceleration in real time, with g-forces generated and the ultimate figures you'd have achieved since the last reset shown around the display ring. The second track apps option, the acceleration timer, allows you to measure acceleration times from zero to a certain speed or distance. It can cut in automatically or work with a rather wonderful countdown start system that counts down to your start with a series of lights, just like the kind of thing you get on a Grand Prix grid. Thirdly, track apps offers a brake performance meter that works the other way measuring your stopping time in seconds from either 60 or 100 miles an hour right back to zero. There's also a lap timer. Everything you need, in fact, for the perfect track day. If you've specified a V8 model, you get two rather glorious further options. The first of these is launch control. Via track apps, you can set the RPM level at which this will start. Even better though, and most brilliant of all if you're of a max power mindset, there's what Ford calls Lion Lock, there to help you do burnouts and developed out of US Mustang owners' love of drag racing. Lion Out uses electronics that'll let you jam on the front brakes and spin the rear wheels at the same time, shredding your tyres for up to 15 seconds, as you would do if you were warming them up for ultimate grip on a drag strip it's probably best not to try that on the high street. On the subject of brakes, well, you're gonna need those to be good in a performance car this powerful, weighing nearly 1.8 tons. Fortunately, they are. All Mustangs sold over here come fitted with what Ford calls a performance pack, which primarily means that larger brakes are fitted than the ones used as standard in the US. There's certainly always plenty in reserve when you press on the brake pedal in this 2.3 litre model and the V8 has even larger front discs and Brembo calipers to help uh, cope with its greater power and performance. We've mentioned the gearboxes so let's talk about what they're like to use. To be frank, we were pleased to find that a car of this kind comes with any kind of manual transmission option at all, particularly one as good as that offered to Mustang buyers with its ideally weighted long throw shift and light clutch pedal. Here though, we're trying the six speed paddle shift automatic that most buyers will want, which doesn't change particularly smoothly, but suits this car's typically American lazy refined cruising comfort zone. That redesigned independent rear suspension system also helps here, smoothing out rough surfaces and keeping passengers effectively isolated from the hurly-burly of what's happening underneath the tyres. In short, this is a great long distance car and a brilliant cruiser too, particularly if you happen to have chosen the convertible version we're trying here. On the move, buffeting is reasonably well controlled, which is just as well as, rather annoyingly, Ford doesn't offer the kind of optional wind deflector that in rival drop tops can clip in over the passenger compartment and calm things down in the cabin. When the time comes to raise the roof, you have to slow right down to walking pace to activate the fabric top but it's quite quick to operate the electric mechanism occupying up to 12 seconds, but requiring you to manhandle a rather cumbersome latch to either lock or unlock the hood to the top screen rail at either the end or the beginning of the process. You don't have to be a committed car fan to know what this car is. In fact, Ford is so confident in the global recognition this model enjoys that the word Mustang doesn't appear anywhere on the bodywork. It helps, of course, that this iconic shape has been seen in so many films and TV shows. Most memorably, of course, the Bullet movie and that car chase with Steve McQueen. This kind of instant recognition is priceless, explaining why Ford has been so careful to keep the shape and style of the original 1960s model while bringing it right up to date in this sixth generation guise. The heritage here might be more than 60 years old, but this modern Mustang looks as fresh as this morning's coffee. 
Get up close and personal, and the long aluminium bonnet with its twin power bulges is a classic cue. But probably the clearest visual link between this car and its 1964 originator is provided by this shark bite nose. It features a prominent hexagonal grille, complete with this model's familiar galloping horse badge, and is menacingly flanked by angry-looking xenon headlamps featuring tri-bar daytime running lights. Underneath the main grille is another large air intake and below that lies a splitter with air dams and fog lights at its outer edges. Get all of this bearing down on you from the fast lane and you'd move over pretty quickly. And then see this, a set of triple slash tail light clusters quickly receding into the distance. They're separated by this large roundel in the middle of the boot, either the charging Mustang horse, if the model is 2.3 litre powered like this one, or a big GT badge if you've opted for the V8. Down below, there's a diffuser style under tray in the middle of the lower bumper with a large exhaust tailpipe on either side. In profile, the look is even more distinctive. Strong twin side creases combining with wide shoulders and a noticeable set of rear haunches. These needed to house rear wheels that on this Mark VI model are set 35 millimeters further out each side to help with the handling. Those wheels are properly big too. 19 inch rims are standard on all variants. And there's clever aero curtain technology to guide air cleanly across these wide front arches. We think the Fastback Coupe model is more iconic with its raked roofline and sculpted rear shoulders. This convertible version though also has a distinctive sense of style with unique rear wings and a flatter boot lid that create a pleasing profile when the roof is down. We should talk about the roof. It's fabric topped and electrically operated of course, but not quite as sophisticated as the hoods you'll find on European rivals. For one thing, you have to be going at an arthritically slow pace to operate it on the move. It won't work over three miles an hour. And for another, you have to start or finish the activation process manually. So once you press this button on the roof rail and waited 12 seconds for the roof to rise, it's necessary to twist this rather awkward latch to finally lock the thing into position. Now it's the same process to retract the roof again, which takes 10 seconds, though for the finishing touch, you have to get out and attach two side trim panels, which is a bit of a faff. Since we're here inside, let's take a look around. A few realities first. In its home market, this is a 15 to 20,000 pound car. And to be honest, you get that feel from some of the trim materials used. Ford has done its best to disguise this provenance with standard inclusion of full leather upholstery and this smartly informative Sync 3 infotainment screen. But that's not gonna be enough to impress you if you come to this car fresh from experiencing, say, uh, Pokia BMW 4 Series or Audi A5. Still, what it lacks in slush molded sophistication, this cabin makes up for in traditional character. You get deeply cowled dials, the right one delivering what it calls ground speed. Plus there are silver toggle switches in front of the gear stick for the various driving modes and a classic looking Mustang branded three spoke wheel, which on closer inspection seems rather overburdened with buttons. You have to master these if you're to get the most from the useful colour screen in the centre of the instrument binnacle that deals with more driving detail than even the most performance-minded enthusiast might want. Need to know about cylinder head temperature, boost vacuum data, the air to fuel ratio and much more? Well, you'll find it right here in the exhaustive engine info section. This display is also the access point for the various safety settings and for Mustang track apps, the options you'll need to time things like acceleration, braking, and your circuit progress. Anything this readout can't tell you will probably be covered off by the eight inch touch sensitive Sync 3 infotainment screen that offers audio, Bluetooth phone, and climate functions. Plus it'll be your point of contact uh, with the optional navigation setup. Many of the functions are operable via voice control and, as you'd expect, these also include connectivity with your smartphone to access apps and music using the Apple CarPlay or Android Auto systems. 
the DAB stereo is usually mated to nine speakers dotted around the interior, but upgrading to the optional Shaker Pro system we're trying here ups that tally to 12. More climate controls sit under this main monitor, and below these is a smartphone size storage area in front of the gear stick that provides both 12 volt and USB sockets. As for other storage space, well, the door bins and the glove box are both rather small, but the double cup holders by the handbrake will each take a supersized shake and you get a useful lockable storage box behind them that incorporates USB and SD card slots. What else might you need to know about this cabin? Well, the silver fascia trim isn't the smartest we've seen at this price point, but these silver ringed air vents look good and there are plenty of Mustang orientated touches. The since 1964 dashboard badge and the red tinged starter button, for example. We also like the puddle lights that project a Mustang logo onto the pavement as you disembark at night. And the keyless entry system that includes the clever Ford MyKey setup, allowing you to program particular parameters into separate key fobs. Via this, you can lend your Mustang out, knowing that the user won't be able to access things like the Sport Plus and racetrack modes, for example. As you get comfortable inside, it's noticeable just how much space there is to move around in here. This is a bigger car than its rivals, and you can certainly feel that, helped by the way that the deeply cushioned six-way electrically adjustable leather seats are supportive, but also luxurious, and are easy to position for a commanding view ahead, though it's rather hard to see over the end of the long bonnet. Forget any thoughts of having a commanding view behind, though, especially in this open-top model. Now, obviously, things are fine when you're cruising in this alfresco mode, but with the roof up, rear three-quarter vision is as woeful as it is with most convertibles. There are no parking sensors either, so you're really going to need the standard reversing camera. Time to take a seat in the back. Now, thanks to the long doors, access to the rear cabin is pretty good by class standards. You don't have to go through terrible contortions to get in. And there's just about enough space in here for a couple of adults to sit in reasonable comfort over short journeys, at least in the fastback coupe model anyway. In this convertible, things aren't quite so nice for those at the rear. With the roof up, it's pretty claustrophobic back here. When the hood's down like this, you'll be blown about quite a bit, which, while fun for a while, ultimately gets rather wearing after a few miles. For kids, though, it might be a different story. Mine absolutely love these close-fitting individual seats, sculpted as they are uh, tightly around this large transmission tunnel. Parents will be pleased to note that Isofix child seat mounts and proper three-point belts are included. Finally, let's deal with boot space. Now, you might expect to have to compromise in this regard with such an out-and-out -out sports car. Think again. True, there's quite a high loading lip and the opening is rather narrow, but you can't argue with the amount of space on offer given the inevitable limitations of a car of this kind. Even this convertible model can swallow 332 litres of cargo, roof up or down. That's 20% more than a rival Audi TTS Roadster, for example. Go for your Mustang in fastback coupe form and it'll be able to hold 408 litres in what the Americans would call the trunk. Plus, the hardtop model allows you to fold forward the 50-50 split rear seat back so that you can extend its carrying ability. The Mustang has always been a blue-collar icon of value for money in the USA, and Ford is just as keen for the car to be seen that way here. You might not initially think that when first faced with the Blue Oval brand's price list, which at launch saw prices pitched in the £31,000 to £40,000 bracket. In terms of performance per pound, though, that still represents an awful lot for your cash, as we'll see in a minute. Essentially, the choices here are simple. Fastback coupe or convertible body styles, 2.3 litre turbo four cylinder or 5 litre V8 GT power, and six speed manual or six speed auto transmission. That's it. No fancier trim levels, no all wheel drive option. You get it 
as it comes. Now, you won't be surprised to hear that the base £31,000 price applies to the 2.3-litre EcoBoost Fastback Coupe manual version. For a 5-litre V8 Fastback Coupe GT manual model, the starting price would be around £35,000. At £3,500 to each of those figures if you want this convertible body style. And a further £1,500 if you want the auto gearbox we're trying here. It's also worth pointing out that Mustangs aren't sold at every one of the Blue Oval Makers dealerships. You'll find this sports car only in the showrooms of the company's premium Ford store locations. At this model's launch, there were 70 of these. Enough, says the brand, to ensure that 90% of the population will be within an hour's drive of one. If, having looked at the asking figures I've just given you, you're tempted to consider personally importing this car, as many European buyers used to have to do, then think again. True, US prices start at just $24,000, which equates to only around £16,000. But that's for a feebly powered entry-level V6 version that Ford has wisely chosen not to sell here. A V8 GT variant spec to match a UK car is around $40,000 or £27,000. On top of that, you'll have to find £1,000 for shipping and £500 for the individual vehicle approval certificate you'll need to register the car. Then there's 10% import duty plus 20% VAT, and at the end of all that, you'd have a left-hand drive car without a proper warranty. It doesn't add up. The only case you could make for personal import would be if you wanted one of the higher performance Mustang models that Ford doesn't yet offer here, principally the track-focused Shelby GT350 and GT350R versions. On to rivals. For us, the most obvious one in concept and execution is Chevrolet's Camaro. Only available to special order here these days, but priced very similarly to a Mustang. It's not been as thoroughly developed for European tastes as this Ford, though. Doesn't have the same kind of warranty or dealer network backup and costs significantly more to run. Not a particularly tempting prospect, then. Which leaves prospective Mustang buyers pitching this car against... Well, what? The 2.3-litre model would, we think, appeal to the kind of person who would otherwise buy something like a comparably powered Nissan 370Z, a car that will cost either a little less or a little more, depending on whether you bought it in standard or uprated Nismo forms. Otherwise, the alternative choices are, we think, rather more spurious. A similarly priced Lexus RC 200T doesn't have the necessary firepower. And we can't really picture a typical Mustang 2.3 buyer choosing a £31,000 Ford Focus RS Super Hot Hatch as an alternative, even though the two cars do share pretty much the same engine. Nor can we really see a typical Mustang man choosing comparable premium German branded models similar in power to this Ford in 2.3 litre form. Say an Audi TTS for just over £40,000 or for around £45,000 an Audi S5, a BMW 440i M Sport or a Mercedes AMG C43. But forget the 2.3. Most early buyers evidently did. Over 75% of them choosing to order their Mustangs with the proper Coyote 5-litre V8 installed beneath the bonnet. You can see the appeal, not least from a value point of view. This is by far the cheapest V8 performance car you can buy on the UK market. A Vauxhall VXR8 GTS is around £20,000 more, and anyway, that's a saloon. Otherwise, for a V8 coupe, you're looking at having to find £60,000 for a Mercedes AMG C63 or a Lexus RCF. A BMW M4 has six cylinders and costs around £57,000. Even a smaller BMW M2 costs around £44,000, and that's got around 50 brake horsepower less power. In other words, whichever way you look at it, the top version of this Ford is brilliant value. If you agree and have decided that this is the car you simply have to have, then you'll need to know just how generous Ford has been with the standard spec. Well, let's see. All Mustang models sold here get something you have to pay extra for in the States, a performance pack, which includes larger brakes and improved cooling for the engine. 
For the 2.3 litre EcoBoost models, this means 352 millimetre front discs and four piston calipers, while the V8 gains 380 millimetre stoppers with six pot calipers. Either way, these sit in large 19-inch alloy wheels. You get a five double-spoke design on this 2.3-litre variant, or the rims come with a multi-spoke finish if you go for the GT V8. Other standard exterior features include xenon headlamps with tri-bar daytime running lights and power-folding mirrors with Puddle Light brand illumination. Plus, owners get a keyless start and entry system, along with a special MyKey system that allows you to program each of the three provided keys separately. You can set up the two spares with restricted access to certain functions. So, for example, if you're lending the car out to your son or daughter, you can limit the top speed and prevent access into functions such as the Sport Plus and racetrack modes. That's if you're brave enough to let the kids drive your Mustang in the first place. I don't think I would be. As for interior equipment, well, all models get leather-covered seats with six-way electric adjustment. These positioning you perfectly in front of a classically styled, leather-stitched, multifunction steering wheel. Through it, you glimpse an instrument binnacle with a display screen that can show trip computer functions and can be used to vary the ambient lighting inside the car between six different colours. It also shows your track apps options, the accelerometer, the acceleration timer, the brake performance timer and the lap timer, all there to time yourself and or to show how hard you're driving the car. Opt for the V8 power model and the track apps menu expands to include launch control and a line lock feature for smoky burnouts. More sensible infotainment is provided by the SYNC multimedia system with its 8-inch centre dash colour touchscreen. This includes voice control, a 9-speaker DAB audio system, the usual Bluetooth phone features and smartphone connectivity via Apple CarPlay or Android Auto. On to options. You can pick from reverse parking sensors and 19-inch nickel lustre alloy wheels, while climate-controlled seats are available to cool or heat your posterior to suit the conditions. To soothe your ears, the so-called Shaker Pro stereo upgrade comes packaged up with 12 speakers and the satellite navigation system that really ought to have been fitted as standard. Or you could have all the features I've just mentioned bundled together in a custom pack that also comes with chrome surrounds for the side windows of the fastback coupe model. Whatever your choice of body style, you'll want to agonise over creation of your perfect paintwork shade. There are two no-cost colours and eight further ones that will cost you extra. To make your Mustang stand out even more, there are also body stripes in silver or black, and you can order the roof of the fastback version painted black to contrast with the rest of the outside. Now, let's look at what will keep you from harm's way. Every Mustang has advanced track ESP stability control and emergency brake assist for the ABS brakes. There's also a tyre pressure monitoring system, Isofix child seat fastenings and a hill start assist set up to prevent the car from rolling back on steep inclines. Should the worst happen, this Ford is fitted with twin front, side and curtain airbags plus a driver's knee bag too. Another airbag is mounted inside the glove box lid to protect the front passenger's legs. Should any of these go off, the SYNC infotainment system will automatically call the emergency services, advising them of your exact GPS location. There's also a pop-up bonnet that springs into action if it detects an accident to better cushion any blow to a pedestrian. Just because the Mustang hails from the land of the muscle car, it doesn't necessarily mean that this one has to come with running costs that will strong arm your wallet. If you want the GT V8 variant though, there's no doubt that you'll have to pay for your pleasures. This time round, the five litre unit may be 10% more frugal than it was in the previous generation model, but it still only manages 20.9 miles to the gallon on the combined cycle and 299 grams per kilometre of CO2 in the coupe, and fractionally worse than that if you go for the convertible. That's for a manual model. 
For the auto, the readings are slightly better, 23.5 miles to the gallon and 281 grams per kilometre, though that's still nothing for Ford to crow about. It doesn't have to be like this. Mercedes, for example, has proved that an equally powerful V8 can produce returns up to 50% better than that. Which is why we're pleased that Ford has elected to offer potential Mustang buyers another more sensible approach with this sixth generation model. True, the turbocharged 2.3 litre EcoBoost four cylinder engine we've been trying here isn't quite as sonorous as its larger Coyote stablemate, but the massive improvement it offers in running cost efficiency is difficult to argue with. Thanks to clever touches like an active grille shutter that reduces aerodynamic drag at the front end, in a fastback coupe manual model, you're talking 35.3 miles to the gallon combined consumption and 179 grams per kilometre of CO2. Again, there's a fractional penalty to pay on that if you go for this convertible body style. To give you some perspective, that's not really much worse than you get from a comparable European sports car like an Audi TTS. It's only fair that we should point out though that opting for an automatic gearbox on a 2.3 litre Mustang has a huge impact on those figures, dropping them to 28.8 miles to the gallon and 225 grams per kilometre for both body styles. On to residual values. You might expect a big, expensive V8-engined Ford-badged sports car to shed its value like autumn falling leaves. Not a bit of it. Thanks to massive demand and relative rarity value, independent industry experts expect this Mustang to retain between 50 and 56% of its original price after the usual three years, 60,000 mile ownership period. Again, to offer some perspective, something comparable like that Audi TTS would retain just 36% of its value. Didn't expect that, did you? You'll need to spec your car up carefully to maximise this return. Buyers will be looking for cars fitted with features like the optional custom pack and the Shaker Pro Premium Audio system. The Mustang comes with the usual Ford three-year 60,000 mile warranty and you'll have the option to extend that package for up to two more years and up to 100,000 miles at additional cost. Breakdown cover is included as standard for the first year. Maintenance might be pricey though because servicing visits will need to be quite frequent. You're supposed to have to visit a dealer every 12 months or every 10,000 miles, whichever comes sooner. To help you budget ahead for this, Ford offers its Protect Premium Plan for prepaid routine servicing, ranging from one year up to three years in duration. This package uh, gets you included Europe-wide roadside assistance too. As for insurance, the Mustang shares much the same ratings as its direct competitors, with a spread from Group 41 to 43 for the 2.3 and from Group 43 to 46 for the GTV8. To give you some perspective, the Group 43 rating applied to this 2.3 litre EcoBoost convertible variant is identical to a rival Audi TTS Roadster. The idea that a car built in America isn't suited to anywhere outside of the USA is blown away by this sixth generation Mustang. Where once we would have seen this Ford as a car only for hardcore enthusiasts and Mustang devotees, it's now a serious contender for any coupe or convertible buyer's attention. Much more sophisticated suspension plays an enormous part in delivering the sort of ride and handling balance that European buyers expect. True, this isn't helped by the fact that this model is longer and wider than most of its rivals, but that does translate into more cabin and luggage space. As a result, you can easily use this Ford every day, something you'll enjoy doing, not least because it's packed with a level of equipment that obvious rivals simply can't match for the money. Sure, there are some drawbacks to Mustang motoring. You'd expect that. The running cost figures of the V8 variant will be shocking for most European folk. The cabin quality doesn't have the slush molded sophistication of an Audi or a BMW rival and parking a car the size of this one might be tricky for those living on a tightly packed street. You know what though? None of this is a deal breaker. 
What's more important is the way that this Mark VI model Mustang has got itself up to date while still staying true to its heritage. No easy task. It looks fantastic and is huge fun to drive, so you'll be even more pleased to find that this model comes so generously kitted out, with space for four while undercutting almost every other competitor on price. There's a lot to like here then, as you'd expect there might be. This is, after all, more than just a sports car. It's the heart and soul of Ford.